Hi, my name is Emily White, and welcome to chapter three of how to build a sustainable music career and collect all revenue streams. Today, I'm super excited about episode five, Get Your Business Affairs Together and Fair Compensation with guest Donald S. Passman. I'm so proud that today's episode is sponsored by SongTrust, the world's largest and most accessible music publishing administrator. Before I share some more info from SongTrust, I just want to say that this is a genuine partnership, which is something that I encourage in all sponsorships and partnerships. I've been evangelizing SongTrust for years just on my own. Um, as any company that's in this book or in this podcast is because I believe in them and think that they're awesome and doing right by artists. After years of evangelizing, I've built a relationship with SongTrust, and this is the first time there's ever been an official partnership. So I just wanted to say that it's very pure. It's very genuine. Um, I do encourage you to sign up now for SongTrust to join over 300,000 songwriters and collect on your publishing royalties from more than 215 countries and territories. Use the promo code SUSTAIN20, that's all caps, S-U-S-T-A-I-N-2-0, at sign up for 20% off of your SongTrust registration. Now I'll say this throughout the podcast and I say it throughout the book. I've said it before on my social media. I'm sure I'll say it again. Many songwriters know that they need to sign up for a PRO, a performing rights organization, which is ASCAP or BMI, for example, in the US. So some songwriters don't know this and your PRO is not something to fear because just recently I heard from some students and artists who hadn't signed up for a performing rights organization. There's nothing scary or bad about a PRO. It's just to collect on your performance royalties on your behalf for you to give you money for your songwriting. But so many songwriters feel that once they are signed up with their PRO that they feel like, oh, I've collected on my publishing. I'm good to go. I'm done. That is not the case. And that is the number one missing revenue stream that I see in general across the board is artists not fully collecting on their music publishing. And Song Trust is exactly how you do that. They're the best at what they do. I've thought that for years uh, before we started working together in, in this way. And I know the principals that founded it who are brilliant. Molly Newman, who is incredible, who runs it, and they have an amazing team. I personally have plenty of songwriters and artists that I work with uh, that have signed up for that I have encouraged to sign up for Song Trust, and they've been happy to get that money. Um, so I, I really want to encourage you to sign up, and I'll continue to explain what Song Trust is, what music publishing is, and that signing up for a PRO alone is is not enough. And of course, sign up for your PRO first, because like I said, I was so surprised to connect with some artists recently, um, some artists slash songwriters who had not signed up for their, their PRO. I'll keep reminding that throughout the podcast, uh, throughout so my social media, and of course, it's in the book for reference. In the meantime, we're going to dig into this episode, which covers chapter three of the book, Get Your Business Affairs Together and Fair Compensation. I spend the first half of the episode breaking down that chapter in podcast form, and then I get to interview the one and only Donald S. Passman to really bring this chapter to life. He was one of the last humans I saw before the pandemic, so that's kind of a wild memory as well. Thanks again to Song Trust, and enjoy this episode. So as I mentioned, today is the chapter three episode of uh, my book and this podcast. And that is every musician's favorite topic, uh, get your business affairs together and fair compensation. So I think if you take anything away from this episode, it's to talk about things in advance and to communicate in general, and then to get all of that in writing. Um, I have a super special guest on today's episode, legendary attorney and author Donald S. Passman, who I'm sure many of you know, wrote All You Need to Know About the Music Business, which is considered the go-to text and, and guide in the business. Um, Don is on his 10th edition, uh, which is very wild. Um, the first one came out in 1991. Um, I've had the complete honor to contribute to uh, the last few editions um, on the modern marketing and, and DIY section. And um, so we'll get into the interview with Don a little bit later, but I just wanted to 
add that um, it was obviously taped pre-COVID. Um, he was one of the last people I saw before everything shut down. Um, I was in Beverly Hills for the Pole Star Conference and uh, took that opportunity to head over to Don's office and um, record that interview. So I'm glad we were able to get that on the books um, before everything shut down. Um, but there's a few references to, you know, Don playing gigs and, and things like that. So I just wanted to add the the pre-COVID disclaimer. Um, but before we get into that, I do want to dig in on this this very important chapter a little bit to go over some uh, go over everything. <laughs> I'm getting your business affairs together. So, like I said, um, communication is definitely queen uh, in life. (laughs) And as far as this chapter goes, so, uh, first I'm going to break down something many of you probably know. Um, the two, uh, main rights in music are the master recording and, um, songwriting, uh, also known as publishing. We'll get in more depth, uh, on songwriting and music publishing, uh, a few episodes from now. It is important for you to understand the two main rights in music the master recording and the publishing or, or songwriting. Um, and that goes for any, um, any music you ever hear. So I've talked about this, but one thing I love about the modern music industry is the option for artists to own their recording rights in particular. Uh, that's something that was basically impossible in the pre-digital era. Um, now most of us have access to a laptop and the internet Um, And we can record and distribute worldwide um, at a fraction of uh, the cost that uh, we we used to. But um, so in the pre-digital era, um, unless you're Fugazi or Ani DeFranco, basically, um, you had to sign with a record company. Um, Record companies were able to fund uh, time in recording studios, which was like only one percenters could afford back in the day. I don't even know if one percenters could. It was just so, so expensive. Um, I know that feels like a different planet now. Um, And then labels also held the keys to distribution. So getting your CDs and vinyl um, out to the world when music was a physical product. Um, Generally speaking, indie labels are 50-50 deals, um, which means you get 50% of the recording revenue after uh, any expenses or any sort of advance is recouped. Um, There certainly are uh, independent labels that own masters forever or own masters for 20 years um, after recoupment. Um, But generally speaking, it's a 50-50 deal. Obviously, read everything before you you sign an agreement and uh, get a good attorney as well if if you're signing with a label. Um, major labels, uh, now definitely tend to want all of your rights, uh, forever. Um, so your recording rights, your publishing rights, your merchandise rights, your live rights, um, your branding rights, uh, you can get in the position to license your masters to major labels, but you really have to be, you know, Taylor Swift level or, um, I think I mentioned this on a previous ep- episode, but I interviewed Freddie Gibbs manager Lambo um, for one of my classes at NYU, and they've worked so hard over the past decade. They are also able to license uh, Freddie's Freddie's albums to major labels, so that's a good position you want to be in. And honestly, um, tools like this book and this podcast are how to get there. It's like build it up on your own, uh, build your audience, and if that's something you're interested in great, uh, you know, signing to a a label or a major label. Um, I've I've said this before, but I'm on panels all the time with label folks, like nodding their head. Yes. At the stuff I'm saying. So, um, no one, no one's going to care about your career more than you do. So it is on you to learn a lot of these modern basics and start to build up, uh, your fan base and create art on your own. And then a label likes to come in. Once in a while, they'll come in just based on music. But if if they haven't seen you post on your social media in months, it's like, again, like, why should they care um, more than you do? And, and that is something that that Don gets gets into a little bit in our interview as well. Um, now, now, here's a part in the book where I'm going to be controversial to many, especially um, kind of traditional older school attorney types. Um, look, like... Producers get a cash fee. Um, They also get points 
uh, they get 5% uh, on the master recording if they are uh, someone we've all heard of, like Rick Rubin or St. Vincent. Um, they get four points or percentage. Uh, points means a percentage. Uh, so 4% on the master recording in addition to their cash fee. Uh, if um, it's someone, like, let's say that's in a big band, you know, someone that we've heard of. Um, three points, you know, on the master side plus cash fee for a producer who has a few titles under their belt, maybe two points plus cash fee um, for uh, a local producer and maybe 1% plus a cash fee for, for a student. Um, I see world-class producers charging $1,000 a track um, If, in addition to the points I mentioned. If you are getting quoted higher than $1,000 a track or more than uh, four points and it's not a producer um, everyone's ever heard of, like, that is well beyond industry standards. Um, these are fights I don't always win, to be totally honest. Um, but I'm calling it like I see it. <laughs> um, so at the same time, you know, I, and, and I, I say all that because I, I've just seen too many producers coming in and, um, you know, asking for publishing on songs they didn't write on and, um, you know, wanting to own masters and when they're getting their cash fee as well. Um, and, you know, or wanting, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% of the master. So I just think that's gotten a little out of control. Um, cause suddenly there's nothing less left for the artists and, and that's why we're here. Um, however, I feel that in the modern music industry, um, you can also get creative uh, with points and percentages uh, for um, producers and people working on your recordings if you truly do not have a cash budget. So if you if you if you have access to cash, please pay people. Please have them sign work for hires, which we'll get into. Um, but look, like if you are working with a friend and they want to produce you, and you literally have no cash, and they know this. You could offer them 10 points, you know, or 15 points. Um, it depends on, you know, how you're paying players or if you're in a band or group. Um, those things can apply here as well. If you're working with a few players that you know well and they know you have no money, <laughs> um, you could cut them in on points when normally players would just get cash and a, and a work for hire. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, the producer, and even if you offer points to an engineer, which is not standard, but again, we're talking like you have no, no money, no cash. Um, then those people that you've awarded points to, um, will share in, uh, recording revenue, whether it's sync, streaming, downloads, sales, all that stuff. So I do think there's ways to get creative. Um, I do think it's important that you own your master rights, uh, definitely if you're paying for everything or anything. Um, and I think you should hang on to 50% of your points on the master recording side um, because you are a label. So that's what an indie label would keep. And you can use that revenue uh, to not only live and eat, yay, um, but also to reinvest back in your career, back into recording, you know, touring when that returns, uh, marketing, promo, all that good stuff. So those are some things to keep in mind um, that some attorneys might hate me for suggesting. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think once you master the tenets of the modern music industry um, and you understand how the old way works too, that's when you can start to, to reinvent it. Um, Let's see, just a couple more things to cover, and then I'll let Don take over this conversation. Um, I mentioned work for hires. Uh, no one should enter your studio space um, or leave your studio space, rather, without signing a work for hire. Um, this means you own the master recording, so there's no ambiguity uh, uh, later on. Um, also, if you are paying cash to players, producers, engineers, um, pay them half their fee up front and then half when they sign the, the um, completed work for hire uh, because otherwise, you know, paperwork can get neglected and it's really, really important that you have that taken care of. It's also definitely an industry standard, old school or new school. So if someone is weird about signing a work for hire, it might be kind of a red flag that they might be kind of a pain um, about business stuff in the long term. 
Um, you didn't hear, hear it from me, but you can find work for hires um, online, I'm sure. Um, otherwise, uh, cosin.com is an option. Uh, their work for, for hires are like 50 bucks. Um, legal Zooms are $60, you know. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely worth the 50 bucks if you have it. Um, the other really crucial thing to talk about up front before you enter the studio is songwriting. Um, I think it's really important if you wrote all the songs that you tell everyone, you know, get together for a Zoom coffee or however people are communicating. Um, assuming you wrote the songs, say, I wrote the songs. <laughs> and if you feel that you contributed to the songwriting process at any point, you have to bring it up in the moment like in the session or immediately after the session. Um, from there, everyone can put the songwriting splits down. And I, you know, I, I would be curious what an attorney's preference would be. I would say email. Um, so everybody replies and everyone agrees and there's a digital record. Um, but the traditional way is uh, once you agree, you write it down, you write down the song splits on a split sheet, quote unquote, piece of paper, um, and everybody signs that. So I would say do both. Um, that should make the attorneys happy and that'll make me happy. Um, but yeah, that way everybody's on the same page and you don't have anyone, uh, you know, coming at you, uh, months later, you know, saying, Oh, I, I wrote on this song. You didn't know that. And, and holding up the release. It's, it's really unprofessional and, and really a shame when that happens. Um, if you do co-write with anyone, um, also include, uh, in your work for hire and or in your split sheet or in your email um, that they their share is pre-cleared for sync, assuming that is cool with the co-writer. Um, I've never met a co-writer that's that it that that is not cool with um, because if they're off fishing or on yoga retreat and not online um, and you're not able to get their permission for a sync placement, you're probably going to lose the sync placement. Um, this also empowers you to say to your sync team or publishing team or music supervisors that any co-writes are pre-cleared so those music supervisors don't steer away from that music seeing more than one writer and thinking like, oh, that's going to be a pain to clear. So yeah, just be upfront about songwriting um, so you have a process and protocol in place. Um, I know nobody likes talking about anything, let alone money, let alone song songwriting splits, but it is way less painful to have that group conversation and put a protocol in place um, than to uh, have someone come around later and, and say they wrote things and, and mess everything up. Trust me on that. Um, and just a reminder that, you know, because I, I feel like sometimes people like are going after publishing because they, you know, on songs they didn't write on because like they hear like that's where the money is. Um, again, just a reminder that if you are if you're working with an artist that lands sync placements, 50% um, of sync revenue uh, is collected on by the master side. So if you are getting points on the master recording side, um, you are collecting on sync money. Now, I would be remiss to not say that, um, yes, there is a little bit more publishing money on the sync side due to performing rights organizations. Um, however, instead of going after publishing cuts on songs you didn't write on, I would encourage you to lobby in Congress um, for performance royalty equivalents on the master side, um, in which the United States, Iran, and North Korea are the only um, countries that do not pay performance royalties on the recording side. Um, there are a lot of great organizations like Future of Music uh, working to change that in the U.S., so I encourage you to get in touch with them um, to advocate for more royalties for recording artists as opposed to going after um, publishing on songs that people didn't, that, that you didn't write on. Um, remixing and arranging is not songwriting. Uh, this is something I learned in, in music school a long, long time ago. And I'm surprised when people don't know that to be totally honest. Um, so yeah, with remixes, uh, you know, you could, you could do a flat fee payment. Um, again, there definitely needs to be a work for hire there. Um, you know, you're also going to want your arranger to sign a work for hire. And, uh, you know, with both, if, again, if there's truly no cash, you could, you could offer them points. That's, that's pretty not traditional on the arranging side. It's a little more common on, on the remixing side. I'd like to see you keep that, um, you know, 
no more than five points if there's no cash, 2.5 points if, if the uh, arranger or mixer is receiving half of their rate. But obviously, if it's some like massive artist coming in and remixing your song, like give them 50% of the master. I don't care. Um, I mean, use your best judgment on that. But ideally, uh, you own the master and, and you retain all the publishing because remixing is not songwriting. Um, if you're planning on releasing a cover song, you will need to secure a license from the Harry Fox agency or from that artist publisher. Um, this has become pretty seamless with the internet, so it's not anything to freak out over. Um, they're going to help you purchase uh, equivalent streaming units for that song, um, but I promise it's, it's not that painful. So please uh, purchase a mechanical license if you are planning on releasing and monetizing any cover songs. Um, and finally, I think this is a really good time to get a group or a band agreement together. Um, when everybody's feeling good, that's when you do your prenup. Um, hopefully you never have to look at it and it just lives in a drawer. Um, again, if someone is, is paying for recording, paying for merch, paying for any promo, um, I mean, someone in, in the band or group, uh, assuming you are a band or group, uh, they should, they should be paid back before, um, other band and group members are cut in, um, they also should own the master as far as I'm concerned, uh, because they paid for it. Um, and then you can split everything after that. And same with touring expenses. I'm not sure if I mentioned that for, for post vaccine time. Um, but yeah, once, once expenses are recouped by whatever, you know, band members laying out the costs of merch and recording and, and things like that, then you can all split everything, um, equally after that, except for publishing. I do feel that songwriting splits, uh, should be real, um, I've had the privilege of working with, you know, huge songwriters, uh, and they could command a higher, um, percentage on songwriting just based on their names, but they don't, they're like, I wrote 10%, I get, I get 10% or I wrote 70%, I get 70%. So if it's good enough for some of the biggest songwriters in the world. It's, it's good enough for, for everyone as, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, so that's my overview on oh, getting your business affairs together and fair compensation. Um, and now I will let uh, the legend, uh, Donald S. Passman, take it over from here. So enjoy my right before COVID uh, interview with uh, Donald S. Passman, attorney to Taylor Swift, Stevie Wonder, Adele, um, and author of the iconic uh, All You Need to Know About the Music Business. Um, I will catch you on the next episode, uh, chapter four how to record with or without a budget. See you then. Thanks. Hi, my name is Emily White and welcome to chapter three of how to build a sustainable music career and collect all revenue streams. Today we are gonna be covering chapter three, get your business affairs together. And I am completely privileged and honored to welcome our guest, Donald S. Passman. Thank you, Emily. Yes, thanks for being here. Um, so as uh, any attorney's time is always limited, let alone someone like you, um, we're just going to dig right in. So you are obviously one of the top attorneys, not just attorneys, but people in the industry. Uh, however, you've inspired countless industry professionals such as myself. I'm sure I've told you this. I'm sure you've heard something like this a million times, but I found your book, All You Need to Know About the Music Business, when I was 13 years old at the mall in Wisconsin. And that's when I realized this could be a real job. And I was talking to Kyle Freenet, um, who managed Bon Iver for a really long time. He's, also, he's from northern Wisconsin, which is a whole different thing. But, um, and he's, he told me something similar about your book. And... I hope it's okay to say that um, you were working with Kanye, or maybe you still do, and you reached out to Kyle because him and Justin worked together, and Kyle said, oh my gosh, it's the guy, when you emailed him. That was, that was his response. So I guess my point is, I know we're all multifaceted and have more than one identity, but do you feel that more people know you as like this top-notch music business attorney or the Passman book, that guy? Does that make sense? It, uh, it does. I'm going to guess that more people know about the book just mm -hmm. because the industry is relatively small and uh, the book has had a pretty good sales yeah. record and it sells to people who aren't in the industry. Um, so uh, that would be my guess. That's amazing. Tell me, 
any thoughts you have on the book over the years? Because it came out initially in the early 90s and you're now on the 10th, 10th edition. So did you ever imagine you'd be on a 10th edition? Well, I hoped. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I, I, you know, it's gone way better than I would have uh, hoped. Uh, I've been very happy with it. Uh, this 10th edition is the most radical rewrite I've ever had to do in the book's history. Uh, and the reason is that the industry has changed so radically in the way that we monetize music. Um, from the beginning of the music business, back when people were selling piano rolls and wax cylinders, uh, music was always monetized by selling something. And the something was, you know, uh, you get a, a, a CD or a cassette or vinyl or something. Now, uh, it's not monetized by selling, it's monetized by how many times people listen. And I can only listen to one song at a time, whereas in the old days, I could go to a record store and buy two or three albums at a time. So it's completely shifted the economic model. Um, and the way that the money works is I get paid more based on how many people listen to my song versus listen to your song. But the, unlike the history, there's only X dollars a month available to divvy up because it's a streaming uh, revenue from advertising and from subscription fees. That's the pool. Now the question is who gets how much of it? Never been true before. Before, I could have a big selling album and it brought people to stores and that helped sell your album. Now, not true. I don't want people to listen to you. I want them to listen to me. So it completely shifts the way music's marketed, shifts the way it's monetized, shifts the emphasis of what artists need to do to make money from the field of music. Amazing. And I'm just curious, who are the non-musician and music industry people buying your book that you mentioned? What, what type of people? Oh, I think there are people that are curious about the industry, people yeah. who want to be in the industry and want to get right. started. I mean, they may even get into the industry, but mm -hmm. when they buy it initially, they're, you know, people with dreams. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that so many people wanted to get started in music and just didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write a very easy to read, simplified overview of a pretty complicated business to let people get educated and understand uh, what they were getting into and how to do it. Well, you certainly did that. Well, thank you. Absolutely. And with your help on the how to get into it, because the whole DIY section came out of our conversation and your expertise in that. I'm honored. Thank you. As am I. <laughs> <laughs> so is there, this is a very open-ended question, but is there an ideal scenario for an artist in the modern era? I mean, they have so many choices on how they could do things. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, your expertise is probably better than mine, but I do know this, that uh, the record labels, if you want to sign with a label, which is a whole different question, but the record labels want to see engagement. They want to see you build social media. They want to see your music trending. They want to see your song getting more listens on SoundCloud or, you know, getting out there and starting to build a buzz. Uh, very different from the old days when some NR guy would go, I believe in this kid. He's going to develop into something and I'm going to nurture him over two or three albums and have a career. Uh, and there are a lot of people who wouldn't be in the icons they are if somebody hadn't done that. But today, it's all about data, statistics, and already seeing something happening, which means if you're a young musician, you've got to go make it start happening yourself. I couldn't agree with you more. Now, master ownership is something that I grew up hearing a lot about as a teenager in the 90s from people like Ani DeFranco, Janet Jackson, Prince, obviously, you know, writing Slave on his face. Um, and here we are in 2020, I, I teach management at NYU and I was shocked. This was just in the fall, um, to hear some students not knowing that they could record and distribute on their own. So as master ownership is something artists have fought for, including your own, obviously, how do you feel about this topic in general? Cause there are obviously pros and cons to any route an artist takes. Right. Well, if, if you can own your masters, you're way better off, period. Uh, if you want to sign with a major label and you don't have a lot of clout, that's not likely. Um, if you've got a lot of people chasing you and a lot of interest, and particularly if you're in the, uh, the rap or hip hop area, mm -hmm. you have a much better chance of doing that and getting your master ownership down, at least down the road, if not right away. Um, but it's totally dependent on clout, and it's mm -hmm. always better to own it than have somebody else own it. Very cool. Um, do you feel that there is, is room for a more transparent player in the streaming space? So, for example, you know, fans often ask, what is the best way to support an artist? And we actually don't have the same answer for every artist, right? Because a fan might be like, well, I always buy a concert ticket or I always buy merch. And it's like, well, maybe they're in a 360 deal and they're still recouping that. You know, maybe you could 
purchase an old master on Bandcamp. So do you, again, do you feel that there's room for a more transparent player in the streaming space? Well, the, the streamers are as transparent as they can be given the billions of lines of data that they have to deal with. Um, you know, a lot of the issues around not being able to find the owners of songs got fixed in the Music Modernization Act, which mm -hmm. I talk about extensively in the book. Uh, and so that's less of a concern now. Uh, you know, whether they're doing it accurately, you know, I think they get audited by the labels to make sure that they do, mm -hmm. the labels get most of that money. So they want to make sure they're getting paid fairly. So I, I think that it's, it's more transparent now than it ever has been in the history of the business when all kinds of games got played with physical goods shipped out here and there, and, you know, games and the royalties and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think things are much more transparent than they've ever been. Do you think there's an answer to that question in general from fans, though, when they say, I want, I want to support you, how do I best do that? I think it depends on the artist. Right. I, you know, some artists are, uh, do well touring, some don't do touring at all. Yep. Um, and some artists, uh, you know, will, will not make any money on their records because they took a big advance, but they'll make money on their merch. <laughs> so I don't think there's any real answer to that. Right. Um, what's important to you for your legendary acts? Obviously, you know, you can't necessarily name client names, but what do you advise for icons who are still with us with regard to you know, their business affairs, holograms, you know, think, we, we hear all these stories. I, I just was on a panel and someone said that, you know, Aretha Franklin's most recent will was found under the couch, you know? So how, in general, how do you advise your clients to take care of things, you know, for their families? Well, it depends, again, on the situation. I mean, if it's a client who owns their publishing, that's a major, their songwriting publishing, mm -hmm. that's a major asset uh, that I think has to be carefully curated. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to sell it. Most of the time I recommend against it because I think it's a generational asset. I only want them to sell it if A, they desperately need money or B, they've got a bunch of heirs who are going to be fighting and destroy the value of it, in which case it may be better to get somebody else involved uh, in one way or another. Uh, in terms of just getting them to take care of business, that's very personal to the artist. Some people are really careful about their business and some people don't want to know about it or in denial. And a lot of them don't want to talk about death at all. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, not just artists, but Absolutely. a lot of people in general. It's an uncomfortable topic. Mm -hmm. So uh, it depends on the specific situation, but generally it's just a matter of, legacy artists are not that different other than they're not likely to have hits on the radio or on streaming uh, just because they're classic artists and their audience is going to be over. Um, but other than that, you know, touring and merchandising and, Songwriting, publishing, things like that are all pretty much the same. Any thoughts on holograms and touring? You know, I don't know that the experience is quite there yet. Mm -hmm. It's certainly intriguing and interesting and uh, and cool. I, it's too soon to tell how big of a or real of a business it is, but, um, but it's interesting and intriguing. Awesome. Um, do you think that the AM-FM Act or something similar will ever pass in the United States? It's unlikely because mm -hmm. the broadcasters have so much legislative clout. Should we talk a minute about what that means? Sure. <laughs> um, in every uh, territory outside the United States, when songs are played on AM, FM, sorry to interrupt, but isn't it except for the U.S., Iran, and North Korea? It could be. Yeah, I, I think so. Oh, all right, then you know more than I do. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay. In every developed major country <laughs> around the world, other than mm -hmm. the United States. Uh, when a, a master recording is played on the radio, AM or FM radio, uh, the artist and the record company get paid for it. In the United States, the songwriters and publishers get paid, but not the artist and the record company. There's been a movement for years trying to put that into effect in the US. It's always been blocked by the people, not surprisingly, who own radio and television stations. And they were very powerful with the legislators who depend on them to get their message out when they want to get reelected, among other things. So it's never had a serious chance of success. <coughs> Excuse me. The interesting thing is that it's becoming less relevant because most of the money now is moving over to streaming where the record company and artists are getting paid. Right. And, and also just to bring that example to life, obviously Aretha Franklin and respect is, is very often associated with that. And there's countless other obviously amazing recording artists that didn't necessarily write the song. Right. Do you still play music? I do. Not as often as I used to, yeah. but I still fiddle with it now and then. And I play in a band with my sons. Oh, that's amazing. 
And you guys play gigs and everything? We do. Yeah, a few a year. What's your band's name? Anything you want to? The Task Fun. Perfect. Pretty clever. Any, <laughs> any gigs coming up? I uh, don't think we have one on the horizon, but we will. It's usually around family events. Cool. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, those are all my questions. I actually have some, some audience questions, but before I dig into that, um, is there anything you want to add just in general, anything you want to say on, on the modern music industry, you know, open question and open platform. You know, I just think we're in a fascinating time because, um, you know, the model has shifted so radically and the industry hasn't adapted yet. They're still trying to figure out exactly how it should work. Um, and let me talk also a minute about the, the controversy, which is not a major one, but it's still brewing, having to do with whether streaming should be paid based on per play or based on per user. And I'll explain what that means. The way that it works now, uh, let's say there's $100,000 that gets collected from streaming in a month, and then it's divided up from the number of how many times a song was played. So if it's $100,000 and a song with and there were 100,000 plays, just to make the math easy, right? And I had 10,000 plays, I'm going to get 10% of the $100,000, right? Now, that's called per play or per stream. Mm -hmm. okay. there, there's an argument to be made, mostly by smaller and more niche artists, because it benefits them, of whether a fairer system would be to do it based on per user. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that I share in the money that the people who actually listen to my song pay. And it sounds at first blush like that doesn't make any difference, but it does. And here's why. Let's, let's assume there's a streaming service and there's only two subscribers, you and me, right? And we each pay $10 a month. Now let's assume that you only listen to artist A and I only listen to artist B, right? But I only listen 100 times a month and you listen to your artist 900 times a month. So under a per stream system, uh, my artist is going to get 10% of whatever the company of our $20 or $2. And your artist is going to get $18. Right? If we did it on per user, my artist would get all of my $10 and your artist would get all of your $10. Right? So that I'm, I'm way oversimplifying and the, it's not nearly as radical as I just made it sound. But, but the, the, the article that I read about it, which is very unscientific, thought maybe it was about a 3% swing from the big players who dominate in most of the plays down to the middle class and lower class and niche artists. And uh, to me, it's a much fairer system. Yes. Because it really rewards the people, you know, who are if they're avid fans can actually contribute to them. Problem is it's really expensive to change over. Uh, and, you know, not sort of quietly, you're taking money from somebody and giving it to somebody else, which is always a bit political. So, I don't know how strong the movement actually is, but it's something that's, I think, fascinating. I think it's very strong, and I think that's what I meant about transparent streaming. You know, just something that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, so our first audience question is from my amazing attorney, Joyce Dollinger, who I know you just saw at a Grammy event. Mm -hmm. um, so she wanted to know if if there's one thing that an artist should know, what, what should that be? Or Sorry, a, that a new artist should know, what should that be? what is one thing in recording and one thing in a publishing agreement that a new artist would be able to negotiate? Well, I'll give you something that's broader than all of those. Try to lock yourself up for as little time as possible and try to have escape hatches if things aren't going well. And that goes for your manager, that goes for you know everybody in your life, your record company, your publishing company, the shortest possible deal and the biggest chance of being able, if it's not working, to get out. So uh, that would be my advice. Absolutely. Um, we have a question from Scott. I'm so bad with last names. Legiri, Legier probably, um, who's a professor at University of Minnesota, Mankato. I can say Mankato. And he wanted to know if you feel there are any more needed or foreseeable changes to copyright for our digital world. Really interesting. I don't. The, the biggest change I'd want to make in copyright is has to do with uh, something called a takedown and stay down. And that's a little bit more complicated topic, but I'm going to sort of brush over it in a big way. Um, but essentially, the services that have content put up by users, like YouTube, as opposed to Spotify, where it's the content's on their own server, has a, has a difference in the copyright law about how it's viewed. And it's not copyright infringement unless someone sends a notice that says, take it down. 
what happened was people sent notices, they took it down, other people put it up. Mm -hmm. So as a practical matter, people couldn't get it taken down. I think if we were gonna change anything, it would be to say, once you get a takedown notice, use your filters to don't let that song go back up. Amazing. Um, I have a question from Craig Snyder at Light, and he would love to hear your take on the archaic parts of the music industry. What's still stuck in the 1950s that could use an update? Well, the fact that we almost laughably translate streams into albums, that, you know, albums have pretty well dropped off the map. They're down to a very small percentage of business. But because we're so used to talking about album sales, people will say, well, 1,500 streams is one album sale. And it's silly in, in one sense, but it's the metric we're used to. So mm -hmm. I think we need to come into the modern age and start dealing with uh, the way things work. I can't help wondering if I've list listened to my favorite albums 1,500 times over the years or <laughs> never really thought about that. Um, one last question from Joyce. Uh, on the lawyer side, um, what is something that you feel that new lawyers in music should do to move their careers forward? Um, I think meet everybody. I mean, what I did when I was building a career was go out and just meet everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I figured that the people who were my age, uh, most of them would fall away, but some of them would grow up to be important players. And since I had no idea who would be who, I would just go out and meet everybody. Yeah. And if you're a young lawyer trying to build a practice, a good idea is to meet A&R people at labels because they at least are about to sign somebody and maybe can send you business that's going to be meaningful. Um, but in the meantime, I took everything at the end just because I wanted to build a practice. Yeah. Where are you from, by the way, originally? Uh, Dallas, Texas. Okay. But then awesome. I moved to California when I was 12. Nice. Uh, here in Southern California? Uh -huh. Very cool. Um, well, those are all my questions, and we're well under time, so <laughs> keeping it very efficient. Any any last thoughts that you might want to add? Uh, I think it's awesome that you're doing what you're doing, and yeah. uh, thank you always for your help with my book, all, the new, all you need to know about the music. It's a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. That's a wrap for this episode of How to Build a Sustainable Music Career and Collect All Revenue Streams. Massive thanks to my very special guest, Don Passman. Um, this was episode five, Get Your Business Affairs Together and Fair Compensation, um, which is uh, chapter three in the book. So hope you enjoyed my overview of chapter three and this interview with Don. Massive thanks to SongTrust for sponsoring this episode. SongTrust is the world's largest technology solution for global music publishing royalty collection and, and administration. It was founded to simplify music rights management and re remove complexity from the publishing landscape. SongTrust collects publishing royalties for more than 2 million songs with a community of more than 300,000 songwriters and rights holders. Use the promo code SUSTAIN20, S-U-S-T-A-I-N-20, all in caps, at sign up for 20% off your SongTrust registration. And if you happen to miss the beginning of this episode where I shared my thoughts on SongTrust, um, I am very genuinely obsessed with them. Um, that is a love and a real endorsement I've had before we worked together uh, in sponsoring this episode or, or anything. And it really is the number one missing revenue stream that I see in songwriters and artists um, because so many artists sign up for their PRO, ASCAP or BMI um, here in the US, and then they think that they're collecting on their publishing. And I, I meet songwriters of all ages and experience levels who, uh, as soon as they sign up for song trust, there's money for them there. So I highly, highly recommend it. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks to my amazing engineer, Nathan Kane. Thank you to Matthew Wong for composing this beautiful podcast music. Tune in next week where I interview Imogen Heap. If you have questions or anything in the meantime, I'm at mwizzle on social media. Catch you then. Thanks. <laughs>